Broadcasting from the Hair Saloon corporate offices, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value but wildly different by nature. Drop the junk you've been fed from the culture and join us here every week as we help you and the people you love feel secure in your beliefs about what you know is right and confident in your desire to speak your mind. I have a very special guest with me in studio today that I'm very excited about. Oh my gosh, this is um, big fun for me, especially in light of the coronavirus, which we can actually talk about that in a minute. So I have my assistant, Kelsey Merritt, with me in-house here. She is from Florida, technically a virtual assistant, but she's in town this week for a few days to work with me. And Kelsey is a very colorful, awesome, interesting creature, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy this. She is a proud, non-woke millennial, because what other kind of millennial could possibly work with me, let's face it, as well as a music industry veteran and small business owner. And we're going to talk today, among other things, about the effects of pop culture on her generation specifically, but really on all of us. So just a little background, Kelsey jump-started her music career at 16 as an artist for Radio Disney. She has shared the stage with a number of notable artists, such as Brett Michaels of Poison, the Jonas Brothers, Vanilla Ice, and Katy Perry. She has written songs with members of NSYNC, had a single chart at Top 40 Radio, signed a record deal with Warner Music Group, spent five consecutive years with the Vans Warped Tour, and attended the prestigious Berklee College of Music in Boston. And get this, that's all under the age of 25. After taking a much-needed break from the pressures of the music industry, Kelsey founded two successful businesses, an entertainment company and a social media and digital marketing company taking care of business. And that's where she and I work together. She continues to play music and manage her current cover band, The Silent Shout, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And if you um, are a follower of mine on Facebook, you might have noted the few postings that I've made of (laughs) Kelsey singing uh, in her band because it's big fun for me to watch that. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Kelsey to the show. Hi, Suzanne. I'm so excited. (laughs) (laughs) It's so fun to have you here. This is so great. Um, And I want to start by telling people about your experience getting into town. And some people will be mad at us probably because if you're very, very stringent about the coronavirus, you might think that uh, she's a little crazy, or we're both a little crazy. But anyway, go ahead and tell your story of getting in yesterday. Well, I've never seen... I travel you know, pretty frequently, and I've never seen the airport. I We pulled into the airport, and there were no cars, for one thing. Uh, I was the only person in the security line. Nothing was open. There was five, six people at my gate, and 15 total, uh, maybe 15 total on my flight. So, And no beverage service. <laughs> It's just which wild and uh, and and you had of course this is the worst part horrible turbulence which I yeah know. and again no beverage Yuck. service <laughs> so, right. so let's go ahead and clarify that <laughs> once more for your listeners awesome oh my gosh and then and then you got in I know you were a little rattled because who wouldn't be after turbulence with no alcohol so or turbulence period um but anyway it's a new day and and we're doing well we're staying six feet away from each other and um. And um, uh, we, you have your hotel to yourself as well. So Clorox and Purell. There you go. So we're awesome. doing we're doing good. Okay. So we're gonna start by just a real quick overview of how you and I met. Suzanne was one of those people for me that uh, kind of changed my life. You were you were one of the people that changed my life. And the reason being is I you know I do a lot of work on my computer, and I came across an article of yours, and I cannot remember for the life of me which it was, but it was on Fox News. And I read it and I just remember thinking like, this is exactly how I've been feeling, but I did not know how to articulate what I was feeling because there was no model for it in my life at all through the culture or anything or anywhere. So let's talk a little bit about that, what that story was, what your background is, because it's very, very interesting, very unique, by the way. Um, but yet similar in some ways in terms of being a millennial, you're 31, 31, 31, you know, your life was pretty much the typical millennial experience, but then some, so go ahead and share with us your, um, your story. I'm originally from Indianapolis. So I grew up in a very Midwestern, very conservative house. I would say I ended up moving, you know, subsequently moving a few times, but, uh, at 15 or 16, I ended up in New York city, uh, which is a completely different (laughs) world mm-hmm. um, than and, the Midwest. Yeah. yeah. And definitely a very interesting 
place to grow up. My family moved with me to New York. My mom moved with me to New York so I could pursue a career in the music industry, which was my dream. Dream mm-hmm. and my goal was to be, you know, in the music industry. Mm-hmm. So I moved there. I went to high school in New York. One public high school and one private high school. Okay. The whole time I was in high school, I was working professionally as a singer, which meant that I was touring, recording records, playing shows. You were like one of those oddballs in college. I mean, in high school where I there was one girl I remember in high school who was never around because she was always doing horse shows. Yeah. Yeah. And I went to a, a, a... private school called professional children's school which was for kids that had careers that were already established interesting so professional athletes ballerinas actors Mm -hmm. i went to school with scarlett johansson oh my goodness art garfunkel's son from uh, simon garfunkel yeah so a lot of very prominent yeah kids that had careers or or you know had parents that were famous. Okay, so growing up in that way, which is so different from most people right. in in New York City, tell me what that background. And you were there from sixteen to twenty four, yes. right? So throughout that time, yes. what was your life like, and what were the messages? What you know, who were you then, and why? And and explain how that article kind of relates to that time. Well, I had always been an oddball in the respect that I was politically a conservative person. I, you know, I was able to think for myself in that way. And why that was hard was because the school that I went to was extremely liberal, extremely left wing. We learned, you know, we were given material that was, that didn't have objectivity of opinion. It was Mm -hmm. very much that way. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was a little bit difficult for me because it, the, the people that I was with and the messages I was receiving in school most of my teachers were female um, in all subjects. So that was a, you know, that was mm-hmm. a... Um, right there. Right, right there. Right it was, bat, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. Um, so... Did you fight? Did you... Not fight. Did you... Um, were you quiet during those years? Or no, you, actually, yeah. I was a lot less quiet than I am now. Interesting. Um, I don't think of you as quiet now either, Kelsey. Just so you no, know. No, I'm... <laughs> but I know I, what you mean. I've learned to uh, not speak too much on my political beliefs only because I don't, especially on Facebook, I just yeah. don't think you can change minds there. So no. I, I, I didn't. But at the time in school, you yeah, would, I did. You I was the only, the devil's advocate or whatever. we, uh, I was in an, uh, environmental science class and I was one of two people on the side that did not believe in global warming. Mm. And I got hammered, hammered for yeah. that. Yeah. Did that cause you to be quieter or louder? Uh, at that point in my time, it, it only – I started skipping those classes, actually. <laughs> yeah, I just said I, I don't feel like I need to be yeah. here. If, if, yeah. if we're not going to hear an alternative view and my parents are paying yeah. for me to go to the school, I'm yeah. not coming for that. Oh, my God. Amazing. So I skipped class. Okay, so okay, so outside of school, yeah. what was your – thinking about your life, you know, your life plan, my, your personal life. My life was solely focused on reaching my goal of becoming a music star. A music star. Yeah. And my friends were in the same I my friends were in the same position. The friends that I met in school were all pursuing similar careers. That's all I thought about. Until what happened? Well, around 27, 26, 27, I started to feel very uncomfortable with my life. Why? Uh, my desires were rapidly changing from wanting the all-consuming career, the fame and the success that came along with that mm-hmm. to wanting a simpler life, Mm -hmm. um, wanting a meaningful relationship, Mm -hmm. wanting more time to do the things that I cared about. Mm -hmm. A simple life. Yeah. A a a more more, um, balanced life. Balanced life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. So that's 26 or 27. And mm -hmm. then uh, is that when you found my, that was when you found my article. Yeah. I I was probably about 27 when I read read your article. Okay, and then and then so I guess that gets to how we met. So you emailed me. I, I did think. email you. Yeah, just as a fan. Yeah, I, yeah. And yeah. then you told me about your had your business. Yeah, yeah. and I yeah, offered you, had, you some help if you needed help with right. social media. 
There we go. Mm -hmm. And I guess the rest is history. It started out sort of piecemeal, um, needing her help um, here and there and using it on a very, very part-time basis kind of thing. And and um, she is now with me full time. I'm very happy to admit, and I'm I feel so like happy. <laughs> I feel like my whole life has changed because anytime I have a need, it's Kelsey, 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 and a lot of it, uh, to be honest, fifty percent of it is you tech know, support. It is. It's tech. Ah. I am so I'm so obviously fifty two and not thirty two in terms of tech because I, I absolutely still need my handheld, and um, my daughter makes fun of me. But anyway, that that's that's the way it is. But that's and so that's half of what she does. But there's a lot more that she does now that I have her with me. All the time. So um, anyway, that's how we met, and that's that's your story. And you even, I, you felt so strongly, and have I think even more so over the years since mm-hmm. we've known each other, that you are in my most recent book, Women Who Win at Love. I yes. have a whole passage from you with your story. Yeah. And what was the gist of that? Basically, just what I told you: how I focused so heavily on my career, how that led to a lot of poor choices and relationships, and you know, with men Mm -hmm. and how, you know, when I was starting to to cross over that threshold of kind of almost hitting 30, Mm -hmm. my whole life collapsed out from under me uh, and my thinking changed Mm -hmm. completely from that and how what I wanted to do and the reason I I let you put that in your book is I wanted, especially for younger people Mm -hmm. um, who may have a goal or a passion that is all consuming to them to just have a little bit of perspective mm-hmm. on where that might take you mm-hmm. down the road when you change and you will change. And of course, anybody who who knows my work knows that that's a slam dunk for me because, you know, having Kelsey and having her story in the book and in my life, because that's exactly where I come in, because I find that a lot of women, unless they're exceptionally mature or independent thinking, they're not ready for my overall message about how to have a balanced life and how to put your relationship, marriage first if you want to get married and how to create a life that allows you to have what you ultimately want rather than following the cultural scripts. So that's why we're such a match, she and I. And it's so great for me to have a millennial in my life on a daily basis um, because our experiences are so different. And yet at the end of the day, we want the same things, right? Exactly. Interesting. And if you would have told so- me that... When I was growing up, mm-hmm. I would have, I would not have been receptive to your message. No. And there are plenty who aren't. <laughs> I've seen <laughs> <But> the- <laughs> them. I manage all of your comments on Facebook. I know. Yes, <laughs> she does. So, so yeah. And I mean, it's so obvious because the people over 30 are much more receptive than the ones that are under 30. Of course. 30. I yeah. Mean, it's just, it's of been, course. it's been an interesting ride for me to, to, to notice all that. Okay. So you have said that you didn't realize how quote unquote brainwashed you were by the culture, even though you've always been an independent thinker. So yeah. what ways do you think it did get under your, you know, skin I think, or whatever? I don't think I ever would have aligned myself with feminism, but now that I look, I have a more objective view of my life. Mm-hmm. I would say that that has been an underlying theme. Um, you know, never depend on a man, mm-hmm. um, sex with impunity, mm-hmm without commitment, Mm -hmm. uh, dating a lot, finding myself. Mm -hmm. Those were all Mm -hmm. the things, those themes of... You first, me first. Yeah, me first. uh, You know, no one's getting in my way, uh, a relationship, nothing. I'm, you know, very strong-willed, very alpha. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those things were cultivated, I believe, because of my choice of career and where I lived, Yeah, you know. And we've talked about that a little bit because, Mm -hmm. you know, we have similar personalities, but mine comes more from having been groomed that way from the women in my family who are all very strong personalities. I I was definitely not affected by the culture in the way that you are. But it's interesting, isn't it, how you can come out sort of the same way, whether it's – because there's several different ways of which you can, you know, adopt your certain mentality or whatever. I had a great upbringing with very – I mean, I had a a great family, you know, that were, you know, very, you know, conservative. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And yet – but that makes sense. Manhattan, music, I mean, hello. Yeah, I mean, it was just – that's you a, know yeah okay so speaking of music yes. let's get to what what you wanted to talk so much about today which is how music is so vital to in, with respect to its influence on the culture and of course i i've written not too much about music specifically although mm-hmm. i have written about both taylor swift and miley cyrus and we're going to talk about them in a minute but i write more about themes and messages that people get through either 
college campuses or in movies, film and TV. Mm -hmm. I've written a lot about that. Not so much the music, because I'm not a big music person like you are, except when it's in my face, like Taylor Swift and the Miley Cyrus. And then, of course, I have to talk. So I've written a couple of, of, of articles on that. So let's talk about the difference of the kind of music that used to be very uplifting and supportive and wonderful and what's how it's devolved over the years and what your experience is with that specifically. You know, something I wanted to to touch on was, you know, I grew up very close to my uh my mom's father, my grandfather, Ed. And the reason I think I have a different perspective probably on music is because I spent a lot of time listening to music with him and some of the artists we were listening to, you know, Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole, Andy Williams, the jazz singer, Nancy Wilson, classic country, Johnny Cash. Oh, love the country. Uh, Hank Williams Sr. Yeah, and yeah. and what I noticed about music then, and of course I wasn't alive, but I've listened to a ton of it, is that the way that women were held up by the messages of the songs was so vastly different than the way women are portrayed in music today. And I feel the culture is pushing a message of equality, but yet there's the music of today is the direct opposite, opposite. of promoting equality. It's it, it degrading. It's degrading. Um, the way the artists dress now, uh, they put their sexuality before their talent. Sex is rampant mm-hmm. in music and not not the idea of sex, but the act of sex. It's it's instead of nuance, it's in your it's, face. It's in your it's, face. It's pornographic. Yep. It's degrading all over. My question to people that that believe that this is empowering is why is it empowering? Right. What about that? Is Would empowering. possibly be better than yeah. the way it was in the as with this other music that you were talking about yeah. back in the day. That's so romantic. Well, like take country music for example. Yeah. I mean, uh, one of the reasons why, and of course, people. Country music is known for, you know, people in the South listening, like we associate, everybody in the South yeah. listens to that. I'm sure they listen to many other things. But, um, and whereas people on the coasts wouldn't necessarily, I remember when I was, you know, I was married and living in New York in my early 20s to a different man and uh, who was from New York. And I tried to get him to listen to country and he would make fun of me. Because it's not cool. It's not cool. I mean, it's like, I, that's, oh, that's my cute wife from the Midwest or whatever. But, and, and there's no question that my pull, when I listen to country music, I feel like I'm home. I feel like I'm with my people. Totally agree. I feel like it's so grounded in relationships. The whole, every country song and is family. about love and family, regular everyday Working. life. Yes. Yeah. And just, it's relatable. It's relatable. It's relatable. And I'm sure that that is what, that and of course the, the beat of country music is fun, but I'm sure, I mean, I can't imagine the beat without the lyrics because to me, they're all the same. And I'm always, I've always been pulled to country music for that reason, because it, it's my values, you know, in light of that, what you said about your grandfather, your music that you've done or that you did a lot through from 15 to 24 or whatever, what, was that good music or bad music? When you got married, things were perfect. You were both in love and life was good. Then somewhere along the line, everything changed. She changed, or maybe he did. Either which way, now your relationship feels, well, hard. I coach husbands and wives who feel lonely, disrespected, or misunderstood in their relationship. So many women today are desperate for their husbands to step up to the plate, to make a decision and to stick to it, to lead rather than to follow. Ladies, you have the power to make it happen. Men respond best to women who are grounded in their feminine core. As for husbands, so many of them want their wives to stop nagging and to just trust them, to smile more and to complain less, to look at them the way they did when they were first dating. Men, you have the power to make it happen. Women respond best to men who are grounded in their masculine core. The secret to lasting love rests in the masculine-feminine dance. Once you master it, your relationship will no longer be difficult. You'll be moving with the biological tide rather than against it. And that makes marriage smooth sailing. If you're struggling in your relationship, if you feel frustrated or alone, I can help. Just go to SuzanneVenker.com, that's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-V-E-N-K-E-R.com, and click on the coaching button at the top. Don't wait another minute to acquire the mindset you need to find love and to sustain it. It's so much easier than you think. That's SuzanneVenker.com. But what was that music? So <laughs> yesterday when I was um, when I was leaving my house, I was taking a shower, and I have a we have a Bluetooth we have music all over. Our of house. course, we have a record player. We have you know Bluetooth speakers everywhere, so we have a Bluetooth speaker in our shower. And I was I have a Pandora radio station, my own Pandora radio station, and I put it on just for some inspiration and. The first song that came up on the Pandora radio station was a song I wrote. I can't remember the year, 
I think it was Too Selfish for Love was the name of the song. Interesting. And I wrote women empowerment anthems. It and oh, I look oh. back on that and I was I was cracking up. <laughs> I mean, I was dying that that was my mindset. It was so What kind of, what did it say? Oh my gosh, the lyrics to I had great songs, love songs I wrote, yeah. but I was just I'm picking a couple off the top of my head that were just so unbelievable to me that those those were things mm-hmm. that I was feeling. It was like basically about having a one night stand and that I that's what I aspired that, to do. Yeah, like, and uh, you basically when you, when it's over, you need to leave so I can get back to work. Wow. I'm dying. I mean, I'm, I'm saying dying. wow, not because that's not totally the norm, but to have it in a song yeah. and writing it and being proud of it. And I thought and I I thought okay, this is an experience that my generation can kind of get down with and yeah. this could probably be popular. Popular. Yeah. But you also happened to believe it at the time. You're yes, saying. Of you course. didn't just write it for yes, them. Yes, of course. This is so fascinating. If you guys knew her as I know her now, well, you've heard her now, so you can kind of, but it's weird for me to even think of you in that mode, knowing you as I do today. But again, that goes back to the whole, gosh, is there a difference between being 20 and being 30? Hugely. Which I is mean, my whole thing is what I want to do with this. And I know that I don't know the median age of your listeners, but this would, you know, if, if you have kids, grown yeah, or, yeah, kids yeah. or, you know, especially, specifically women, uh, girls, you know, that are coming of age and in a really turbulent time such as this one. Yeah. Uh, if you can get them to listen to this podcast, I would encourage it just because I, I've lived and I'm not a I'm not a nerdy person. I'm. Yeah, she's very cool. She's very hip. Of course, in the music industry, you kind of have to be. But I'm the nerd. <laughs> and you're not a nerd at all. I think you're the coolest, actually. You're so cool. I, she's like, Suzanne is the counterculture, which yeah. is, to me, is like what used to be the counterculture. Like, Suzanne is punk rock. That's the way I see her. That is the way I see you. Because you're not mainstream. No, I'm not so mainstream. You're punk rock. And in fact, I've talked with my with my family about this, that back in the day, I would have been, I would have stood out for different reasons. You know, if I grew up in the fifties or sixties, you know, I would, I'm all, I've always been rebellious by nature, always my whole life. But that's the interesting thing about being a rebel. You can't define the rebel without talking about the culture that you're rebelling against. Right. It depends what that era is. There are plenty of things that I would have rebelled against back in the fifties and sixties, even though today people associate me as Oh, that's that woman who wants you to go back to the 50s, which is such okay, a ridiculous... Okay, boomer. Yeah, right. <laughs> or okay, boomer, which is such a simple, simplistic way of describing my uh, views and writings. But um, but yeah, I mean, like, it, it's it's all about thinking outside the box. So whatever that box is, if it's negative in any way or not good for you to ignore it and do your own thing. I mean, and I that's think... really what I stand for. It doesn't really matter... I mean, that's the underlying. I think it's important also to challenge your own beliefs and figure out why you think the way that you do. And if it makes you uncomfortable to hear an opposite opinion, that you need to listen to that opinion and you need to be open because you can't live in the bubble. Well, I know you feel very strongly about that when you get, when you'll do, you'll post some memes for Mm -hmm. me that are pretty, you know, so she creates memes. I mean, we create them together, but I pull them from my work and it's like a really striking statement that can stand alone. And so she'll create this meme and put it on fo- Facebook. And if it's something that a millennial in particular or a young 20-something today, I guess, I don't know if they're millennials still, uh, it gets upset about, you know, you'll get, I'll get these horrible comments and there'll right. be like a thou- uh, hundred thousand views because they share it with all their friends and all they do is rant about it. And that should be such an indicator yes. that you're the one who's got a problem if you're going to react in such a Well, if a you way. react so strongly to something, that means it's hit you somewhere in your core. That to me is where the truth lies. lies. Absolutely. If it's really, if that offends you, I can scroll through things all day that I don't like. But when you have a reaction, like yeah. some of these people do to your work, it's because inside of them, it's it's hitting a soft spot. That's what I think. But no question about it. And it's it's you know over the years, people have asked me, you know, how do you deal with, um, you know, all that blowback? All I have to say, the blowback has really subsided in the last few years. It's it was a lot worse. I've certainly had my share of it in the past. It hasn't been so much lately. But it took me a long time to come around to that. You know, it's been 20 years where at first when it happened, I'd be like, Jesus, what the hell's wrong with these people? You know, and now I'm like, eh, whatever. The poor thing. They just can't, they can't look at themselves yet, you know, and eventually they, well, they will or they won't. But 
consider the source. It's not personal. It's got nothing to do with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you about your experience then in light of what you're talking about in the male-dominated music industry, especially in the era of Me Too, and what your choice of career has meant for your life in that regard and, and what your experiences were. I know you, you tell me some stories about being on a bus with all men and, and your take on uh, being in an environment like that is so not what you typically hear with the Me Too folks. So share that story. Well, you know, I did my fair share of, of being on a tour bus, touring, you know, throughout the summer. And I was always... Oh, excuse me. What age would you have been at this uh, point? Gosh, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Okay. okay. I was touring pretty heavily to support whatever it is, your, you know, whatever album you have at the time, you have to get out and tour. That's a big part mm-hmm. of making it happen. So I was on a tour bus with, you know, typically, you know, 10, 11, 12 guys, maybe one other girl that was selling merchandise, but I was in a position of equality. Yes, right, right. I was, I was working for myself with my band, managing my own band alongside, you know, hundreds and hundreds of male artists artists Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. bands. So my experience as far as it, as it pertains to me too is I never had a problem that I didn't ask for. Does that make sense? Uh, to me perfectly. But you, um you might want to explain it in a way that so the listener because the listeners also know exactly what you yeah, mean but they, I, they hold on people want to know how to explain what they know right to the other side um, in a way that they can hear it. When I became one of the guys okay uh There was a lot of respect for me when I didn't dress provocatively, when I didn't lean over and initiate. When you weren't oozing sex, sex. like like the ladies on Fox News, for example. (laughs) (laughs) Um, when, When I carried myself in that particular fashion, when I knew who I was, when I wasn't to be messed with, when I didn't ooze sexuality, when I wasn't... Using that side of yourself. Using that side of myself, I never had an unwanted advance. In fact, there was always a lot of respect because I carried myself in a way that demanded it. That demanded it. Mm -hmm. Or commanded it. Yeah. Not commanded it. Demanded and commanded it. Um, And I could have had plenty of opportunities to be. Sounds like it. Yeah. And and let me put it this way the times when maybe, you know, I was inviting those things on. That was my choice. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that people don't have bad experiences mm-hmm. with men and that, you know, you get into a situation that you didn't intend. But what I'm saying is in my experience personally, when I commanded respect and I was not oozing sexuality, I never had a problem with a man in the music industry. I worked late hours around alcohol i was in recording studios alone with men men my age men older than me men younger than me i never had an unwanted advance from anybody that i worked with and you know that just shows really when you appeal to a man's decency or humanity Mm -hmm. which most men have plenty of they rise to the occasion but if you do the opposite and tease them or of course or use it to get their attention you cannot then turn around and complain um, that they responded now that doesn't mean of course responding is okay with with violence or or the rest of course not um but 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 for every action there's a reaction right and so mixed in with those legitimate cases let's use the harvey weinstein as a you know legitimate case or whatever and all the fuzzy cases that came after. Right. It, you can't lump them in. You just can't. No. I mean, remember when those actors, there were a couple of actors who tried to say that, Matt Damon and someone else. No. They tried to say, look, there's a difference between squeezing someone's ass and yeah, winking course. at them, and or, you know, or whatever. When you appeal yeah. to a man's nature, which also speaks mm-hmm. to the difference of men and yep. women, yep. Um, I don't see where you're going to get a different result. If your breasts are out, if you're leaning in, if you're using innuendo Uh in that way like Uh what men are programmed yep in that way so why invite it if if that's not something you want because yeah because so many of them do want it they want the attention and they want to get ahead too and and, and that's and that's part part i mean women have been using their 
wiles, as they used to say, since the beginning of time and still do. I actually use my wiles when it comes to getting out of a um, ticket. I've done it. Ticket. I, listen, that's, <laughs> I use it all the time and it works almost every time. Isn't that the beautiful thing about being a yes. woman that if you, if you, if you are smart about it, yep. you can really, I feel the equality yep. thing is not an issue with me because I almost feel it's empowering yes. to be female. Yes, it is. Of course it is. And it's if you advantageous. It, if you use it correctly, uh-huh. it you can really get mm-hmm. far. Right. If you use it in the wrong way, you're going to end up you you know, you're with a problem. To, with a problem. Yeah, with a yeah, I, you know. All kinds of problems. All kinds of problems. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Okay. So that's a very interesting story, but yes. and I think that I mean because again, that's very unusual. Most of us have not toured on a bus with all men mm-hmm. when we were 20 years old. What do you think is the downside of being raised in an environment like we have today where young women are conditioned to, this goes back to what you were saying a little bit earlier about your own experiences, but to find themselves, to postpone marriage, to be completely, really, I guess the only way of putting it is self-involved and worrying about all that other stuff later, meaning marriage and motherhood, let's Mm -hmm. face it, that's what we're talking about, as opposed to creating a life that centers on family whoops the downside of being raised in an an environment like we have today and and i can speak to this is when you put yourself first and you are you know the big thing is trying to find yourself well i spent 10 years doing me Mm -hmm. living my life Mm -hmm. focusing on my career and i don't think it helped me find myself at all in fact I'm engaged now. Oh yes, to a, we should, yeah, yeah we to a, a lovely guy who's a, just an amazing person, and I find myself like asking you, Suzanne, how do you be married? How? So, so this is a great question. Because, I mean, not just that question, but this is a great um, conversation because I have very strong feelings about this concept of finding oneself. I have. Surprise, surprise, a very countercultural view of finding oneself. And that is that you never really do until later in life. That in, that that ironically, it takes decades to actually come to, you know, terms with who you are, how you were raised, what you want, how you, what you believe. Um, and a lot of that, at least in my experience, has come from raising a family, interestingly enough. So my argument is that you're actually just kind of hanging out, wasting your time until you get married right. to your family because that's when the real learning begins. Yeah. That's what, look, being single is the easiest thing in the world. You can get up every day and look in the mirror and decide to face what's in the mirror or not. Who cares? No one's, you're not responsible for anybody. You can just live your life any way you want. It, it's in the act of sacrifice where you really discover what you're made of and it forces you eventually to think back about how you were raised in a deeper way and what you did and don't like and what happened there and how you want to do it differently and it's just about really reaching deep and i don't believe that for the most part people who are perpetually single are reaching into that spot so there's no really there's just no way to find yourself throughout your 20s it's just it's just been a big joke it's been a big farce and the idea of finding that perfect person oh yeah and dating and dating and dating and dating Uh, and sex and sex and sex and and whatever and to me now that i've experienced a lot of that yeah um i'm starting to think that maybe my life is just beginning with this next step that i'm taking Of of marriage because it's that's like you said, that's where the real discovery begins. Mm-hmm. Yep. And and really what people end up doing that go that other route is just accruing heartache after heartache after heartache. And um, you're no better off for it. No. In fact, if anything, it'll be detrimental uh, potentially when you are finally settled down with, with one person be- for a whole lot of reasons. I mean, uh, the lifestyle that you lead in your 20s has no bearing whatsoever on what happens after you get married. And so you're not preparing yourself for marriage at all. No, the, and, and you're also 
developing a lot of bad habits. Uh-huh, which there you go. I am totally, I'm 100% yeah. guilty of. Um, and, and face it, a lot of people are still living that life of searching and finding oneself themselves in their 30s. Oh, yeah. No question. I mean, it basically just prolongs it's adulthood. It prolongs it, adulthood. It, correct. It, it does. That's all know? it does at the end of the day, which is not to say everybody should run out and get married at 22. It's it's simply to say to shift your priorities and understanding that actually settling down is when your life begins, not not something to push off as far as you possibly can no. because you want to avoid it. No. So, and, and that doesn't even get into the, the problems with waiting a really long time to have children, but or even to get married because we know and I've written and talked a great deal about the longer you wait to get married, the pool of men, this is for women specifically, the pool of men shrinks when you're in your thirties of course. and those guys are, can they can marry someone who's much younger. And so just from a s- strategic point of view, it's not smart, but, and it's not empowering it, it, either no, to, 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 to get just, to that point, <laughs> to get to that point or but, to just n- treat, you know, specifically sex with a, with a very flippant attitude of yep. whatever men and women are equal. I can do it. If he can do it, I can do it. That is not for one thing, you know, no, no, <laughs> it's just, it's not, it's not empowering at all. It's it it was the exact opposite for me. In fact. So I guess you can all see now why I love Kelsey so much. I love, it, she's. It's, She's my like, <laughs> she's my mentor, and I love Suzanne. It's, it's just, it's a great, it's a great, it's so great to um. This is she's a, she embodies what I'm trying to reach for young women, and if it takes being you know hitting that thirty mark before people listen, that's okay with me. There's plenty of people over thirty. <laughs> if the twenties aren't interested, twenty something. But try to get your kids, I guess that are of that age to li- to at least just you know, challenge their thinking a little bit, you know, listen to the podcast, like try it's, and it, it is parents responsibility to be an uh, alternative voice. For yeah. What's going because on there the is yeah. no alternative voice. No, there is none. I, and I just wrote about that recently that there is nothing left except for parenting. I mean, parenting really is since we don't live in a culture like, like you described. In fact, I don't know if you want to say anything more about those, that music back in the day from your grandparents that was so uplifting. And if you imagine living growing up, I mean, just imagine the difference of growing up in the forties and being uh, on a daily basis, listening to the kind of music you were talking about versus today. The influence. The daily diet of that. Is so, it's profound at what that would do for you. Mm -hmm. You know, you listen to an artist like Nat King Cole, like I said, Frank Sinatra. I mean, it's, there's chivalry, there's, there's actual dating. It's not jumping into bed, although there might be sexual innuendo, yeah, which right. is so much hotter. Oh, so much hotter. I mean, oh my gosh. That's something you that's know. really, really, really gone. For, I mean, people, you wouldn't even be able to explain this to a young person, I don't think, but the difference between what you wear to show your sexuality mm-hmm. versus, you know, Audrey Hepburn years, right? Oh my gosh. Where you wore form fitting clothing. But it was very feminine. You could see the buttocks. You could see the breasts. You could see the hourglass, right? Yeah. But the but the outfits were so feminine, so beautiful. And then you had to imagine what was under there, yeah. right? And it wasn't, you know, bend over and yeah. slap my ass yeah. like it is now. <laughs> I mean, I you know, I'm sorry. I shouldn't even laugh. It's just not it's even funny. It's pathetic. It's pathetic. I wish somebody would juxtapose these two things and put them right next to each other. I'm sure somebody's done this with a meme. And you can see which which you think is obviously um a, a more profound and uplifting and which one really is promoting the equality that we so yes, that too are so after all right we could go on forever kelsey we could but i guess it's time to well, say you can goodbye. have me back we'll come yeah well you don't even have to come all the way in we could do that from florida but it was nice because we're working together so i thought it would be good to have you come in and it's been lots of fun so Thank you very much Thank for you. letting me introduce you oh, to my I'm peeps. Oh, I'm so happy, and I hope it helps some one person. If it helps one person examine their life a little differently. Amen. Um, then that would be awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to tune in next week when I talk with self-described recovering divorce attorney, Douglas Gardner, who's written a book on saving marriages. And if you haven't done so already, don't forget to continue the conversation on Facebook where we've set up a private group that you can join. Just type in the Suzanne Venker Show in the Facebook search bar and you'll find it. And if you have a question or comment for me, email me at Suzanne at the SuzanneVenkerShow.com. 
Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.